Well, every once in a while in life, there's a question that kind of gets popped into your story that forces you or causes you to instantly get perspective. Uh, years ago, I was at a retreat, and the speaker of the, the, speaker of the retreat uh, gave assignment with this question. And he said, take a piece of paper and answer this, this question. The reason that I want to go on living is blank, blank, blank. And uh, he said, take that piece of paper, answer that uh, with whatever comes to your soul. And I thought, oh, that's a, that's a little deep. That's a little heavy. Um, it was a powerful question for me. And what he was asking was, what is your purpose? What is it that makes your life worth living? Today we're going to listen to Paul's words as he shows us his purpose. But first, before we get to uh, what Paul's purpose is and what Paul's guiding vision or orientation of life is, we need to do a little background work. So before Paul writes the words that we just read, if we go back about five years, press rewind, here's the situation. Paul is one day worshiping at his temple. You can read this in the latter, in the latter chapters of the book of Acts. He's worshiping at a temple in Jerusalem, maybe in a setting kind of like we're in this morning. And uh, there's Jews on the outside of the temple who have it out for Paul, and they start to spread rumors about Paul, and an angry mob forms outside of the temple. I don't think we've had that happen at Bow Valley Church, and um, Lord willing, that won't happen. But here's what the angry mob does. They rush into the temple, and they grab Paul, and they grab him, and they grab him, and they drag him out of the temple, where they proceed to beat him, and their intention is to beat him to death. And if I was Paul at this point, I'd be saying, what is my purpose here, God? Because <laughs> I was just in the temple. We were worshiping you, and now I'm out here getting beat up. Like, I thought life was supposed to be about being happy. That the reason I want to go on living is because there's happy things ahead of me, things ahead of me today. I'd say that's our purpose, but that's not Paul's purpose. Well, Paul's out there getting beat up, and something happens. A Roman commander hears that, about what's happening outside of the temple. And so the Roman commander rushes in to break up the fight, not because he cares about Paul, but because his job is to keep peace. And so Paul is there, and imagine him outside of the temple. He's, uh, there's blood all over him. He's been beat up, but he's still breathing. And the Roman commander looks at the situation and assumes that Paul must have done something awful, that he must be guilty of something to get such a beating. And so he arrests Paul. And he arrests Paul and he takes him to prison to interrogate him. And then he decides that he's going to beat a confession out of Paul to figure out what is he has done wrong. So they string Paul up and they're about to flog him. Sounds like an eventful Sunday, doesn't it? So just as they're about to flog him, they're about, the soldiers now are about to beat Paul, bring the first blow down. Paul says, speaks up, he's like, ah, I didn't realize it was okay for you to beat, for you to beat up a Roman citizen who's been convicted of anything. At which point the soldiers panic and they all kind of look at each other because they didn't know that Paul was a Roman citizen. And if you're a Roman citizen, you're in real trouble if, you, uh, somebody, if the Romans start accusing you and arresting you without a just trial. And so uh, they realized that if they had gone on to beat Paul, then they would be the ones that would be put in jail. So the Roman uh, guard is all going crazy and the Roman commander doesn't know what to do. So he realizes, wait a minute, I arrested a Roman citizen. He hasn't been charged with anything, but I can't set him free because there's a bunch of Jews. If I let this guy go, they're just going to kill him. They're already plotting his death. So what he does is, in the middle of the night, he keeps Paul around and then he sends Paul, he sends him with 500 guards. That's how you know you're a special prisoner. And basically, the Roman governor sends him with all of these guards to, he basically wants to get rid of him. So he sends him to Caesarea, 50 miles away, and he sends them to a different governor, Governor Felix. Basically, he says, I found this Roman citizen. He was about to be killed by the Jews. I rescued him. I thought it best to send him to you um, uh, so that uh, you can figure out what to do with him, oh, great Felix. <laughs> In other words, here's this hot potato called Paul. Now you got him. Got him. So anyways, that's Paul off. Well, the next day, the accusers come, they accuse Paul, they bring their charges against him, and Governor Felix realizes he's in a pickle here because Paul is not your average Roman citizen. He's got enemies, but he's also got lots of friends. So here's what Felix does with Paul. 
for two years, he keeps Paul in prison. So two years, without any charges, he hasn't been convicted, but the governor, Felix, is waiting to see if his friends have enough money to bring a bribe to sort of set Paul free. Two years, nothing. So you imagine Paul, at this point, he's got to be thinking, God, what am I doing here? I was just at the temple. I've been beat up. Now I don't know what's happening. I'm in prison. I haven't been charged. This is illegal. I thought that life was supposed to be secure, that part of the purpose in life was to have comfort and security. But that wasn't Paul's purpose. Well, two years in prison. Well, the the governor, Felix, goes on. A new governor comes in. The new governor decides, listen, the best thing we can do with this guy is send him back to Jerusalem where this whole thing started. He can have a trial in Jerusalem and get this sorted out. But this is not good news for Paul because Paul knows if he goes back to Jerusalem, he's going, it's going to be a one-way ticket. So Paul does something. It's basically his last card that he can play as a Roman citizen. He says, listen, I am going to appeal to Caesar. It's like going to the Supreme Court. So every Roman citizen had this right. So Paul says, I'm going to appeal my case, not to Jerusalem, because they're going to kill me there. I want to go straight to Caesar. And so Paul then, by the new governor, is put on a ship with a bunch of other prisoners to set sail to Rome to make his case to Caesar. Got the picture so far? He's on this ship, and he's out in the open sea, and a storm blows in. And the ship slams against some rocks, and the whole thing explodes and everyone, all these prisoners on the ship are like grabbing for something that will float. Eventually they grab a hold of something that will float and they make their way and they're washed up on an island. What a story this is with Paul, right? He gets to this island and he's finally safe on this island. Well, he does get bitten by a snake, but that's another story. And he survives on the island and he goes all the way through the winter until finally another ship comes and gets Paul and the prisoners and takes him to Rome. Paul gets to Rome, finally, and he's put under house arrest, which basically means um, he's waiting to to give his appeal to Caesar. He doesn't know what's going to happen, but he's under house arrest, and you have to pay for your house, and basically what happens is you are chained to a Roman guard 24 hours a day. Your privacy is gone seven days a week, and if you can't come up with payment, to stay in the house that you're arrested in, you'll be thrown in a dungeon where for sure you will die. So here's Paul. Doesn't know where he stands with Caesar. Everything is uncertain. Doesn't know if he's going to be executed. Doesn't know if he's going to have enough money to pay for this house arrest. Doesn't know if he's going to be set free. If I'm in Paul's situation, I'm saying, God, what is the purpose in this? I thought you blessed your people. But that wasn't the purpose of Paul's life. So here he is, under house arrest, He's chained to a guard. He doesn't realize that he's doing this, but at that place, at that time, he is writing a big chunk of the New Testament. He's writing these letters to different churches, and one of the letters that he writes is to the church in Philippi. And he writes to these churches, and what he explains to the church in Philippi, I just read it for you, is basically this. Listen, God is still at work. God is accomplishing his purposes, even though it doesn't seem like it. And then he gives them his purpose. All of this stuff has happened, but this is the purpose that has enabled Paul to carry on. He puts it in verse 21. For me, Paul says, to live is Christ, to die is gain. That's our memory verse for this week. Let's read it out loud together. For me, this is what Paul's life is about. This is what enabled Paul for the last five years to hang on. He knew something. He he was fixed on what was making life worth living for him. And let's watch how this plays out. So with this purpose, Paul is able to understand life in some really profound ways. I'll just pick three of them. The first is this. For Paul, because of his purpose, adversity in his life actually means advance. Notice what he says. He says, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, what has happened to me, I just told you what happened to him, has actually served 
all of that awful stuff to advance the gospel. It's become clear throughout the whole palace guard to everyone else that I'm in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the other brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. A little bit later, he says in verse 19, he says, I know that through your prayers and the provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. It's, it's astounding. He, basically, what he's saying is this. As bad as it was, God was working something out throughout history in my life and personally. What happened looked bad, but it turned out for good. Why did it turn out for good? Well, it says that it advanced or it served the advance of the message of Jesus. So here's Paul. He's chained, literally chained. The chain, they say, was probably three or four feet long. So this is not a big chain. Different guard comes in every six hours of the 24 hours, all day. So Paul does nothing by himself. He, he doesn't eat, he doesn't go to the bathroom, no privacy. He's chained to someone 24 hours a day. Now, the palace guard that would have done this is really interesting because uh, it started out, this palace guard, being about 12,000 people of the most elite, hand-picked military soldiers in the Roman Empire. And so usually what happened is you would, you would have this role, guarding prisoners, as part of your way to make it up to be uh, in a position of military and political power. So the people that Paul was talking to would go on to have significant role. He's basically chained to the future leaders of the Roman Empire. As one commentator says, though, <laughs> Paul wasn't chained to them. They were chained to Paul. <laughs> And that's how, that, can you just imagine, so here's Paul, one of the greatest minds in all of history, certainly one of the greatest theologians and evangelists, and basically you can kind of see himself, see him smile, can you see him there in prison, smiling when they bring in a new guard. Oh, good. And now I'll have another opportunity to advance the gospel. It's fascinating. How could he do it? Because he knew his purpose. Well, maybe today I, I, I find strength in this verse, in verse 14. Now, and, and I find it very fascinating where Paul actually says, it happened, notice the line, because of my chains. Because of my chains. You would think that the chains that he was being forced to be wrapped in would actually be the thing that would keep him from going out and preaching the gospel in all these big campaigns. But it turns out, it was just the opposite. It's just the opposite. Have you ever felt like there are things in your life that feel like chains that are keeping you from really living? Maybe you're chained to something that you're like, man, I would fulfill my purpose in life if it wasn't for this. And Paul would say to us today, listen, I've got a purpose where that very thing is actually what brings about the purposes of God. So maybe today you're chained, you feel like you're chained in a dead-end job or you're just with some coworkers you can't stand. And you're saying, God, deliver me from these chains. <laughs> deliver me from this job. And God is saying, listen, maybe, maybe you're there. Maybe you're there so he can accomplish it. Or maybe you're chained to what feels like a bad marriage. And a spouse that doesn't love you or respect you and you're thinking, being chained to this marriage is what's keeping me from being happy. It's ruining my life. But maybe God's got a bigger purpose than your happiness. Maybe you feel like you're chained to a grumpy neighbor and you're just hoping when you drive home after work that there'll be a for sale sign <laughs> in the front lawn. <laughs> and maybe, or maybe you wake up in the middle of the night and you think to yourself, maybe I should go put a sign on their front lawn. Or maybe... Maybe God has you chained to that neighbor because he wants that person to experience his love through you. Or maybe you have a rebellious child or a broken down car or a house that won't sell or a job that you can't seem to get and you say, God, why is this happening to me? But maybe that is your greatest opportunity to show that your trust is really in God. The point is this. Our greatest obstacles could provide for us the greatest opportunity to show the world the God that we serve. So, so don't assume that just because you got cut from the football team or you didn't make good grades or you didn't get that job or you got dumped by that person, do not assume that God is not at work. 
Don't assume that because you can't find a job or can't find a spouse or you can't seem to find your career that you want. Or don't assume that because your chil- child has been diagnosed with an illness or your business is going under, that God will not be able to work through those chains to accomplish your purpose in life and his purpose in history. Let me just hang out this just a little bit longer. Notice two things that happen um, when Paul is faithful to his purpose in this situation. One is, and this is the same for you and I, uh, when we are faithful in the midst of our problems. One is that it's a witness to unbelievers. Paul has basically spread the gospel through the Praetorian Guard. They were the secret service of the day. They influenced who would be the next Caesar. So Paul, only God could do this. Only God could do this. It, it, Paul begins to spread the message of the gospel. It filters through the guards. And after Paul's life, history tells us that actually Nero, the, Caesar, the emperor, actually had his own wife uh, and mother-in-law killed because they confessed Christ as their savior. That into even Caesar's family, the message of Christ was known. Which is to say, any trouble that you're going through, and I know you've got some this morning, uh, those who do not know Christ are watching how you handle it. It could be one of the greatest opportunities that you'll have in your life to present the message of Jesus with your words and present the the presence of Jesus with your actions. If you stay faithful in adversity, the gospel has a chance to advance in ways that it would never have otherwise. The second thing that happens is, one is that you're a witness to unbelievers, and secondly, when you are faithful in your problems, when you can see your adversity as an opportunity for advancement, it will be an encouragement to believers. Verse 14, And because of my imprisonment, many of the Christians have gained confidence, become more bold in telling others about Christ without fear. When you hear the testimony, you know this is true, when we have a testimony up here on a Sunday morning and somebody's going through some difficult times, maybe somebody died or they're going through some um, mental uh, health challenges or whatever they're going through, you hear their story and you think, whoa, I thought I had it bad. And you see them be faithful and you are able to hang on and be faithful. Isn't that true? And the gospel gets advanced. So think of a problem you're facing right now. How could God use that problem and how you're seeing it and responding to it as a way to get the gospel of Jesus to the world or a way to encourage the people in this room in their faith? I think you can probably come to some answers pretty easy there. So for Paul, with his purpose, adversity could actually mean advancement. Secondly, rivalry causes rejoicing. There's some people, this is interesting to me. So there's Paul. Um, he, he says, other people are preaching Christ for all of these reasons. They're jealous of me, and so they're trying to make a name while I'm in prison, and, and they're trying to make me jealous of them like they were jealous of me, and Paul says, it doesn't matter. I, I, I sort of like that, uh, the line. He says, uh, the important thing is, in other words, what does it matter? In other words, who cares the motives of people? Who cares if people are trying to hurt me? Who cares if people are trying to be a rival? In fact, at the end, he says, I rejoice because there's good that's coming from it. Could you imagine having such a purpose in life that the success of others does not feel like it lessens you, but that you can just rejoice fully? This is like next level Jesus following. I don't know if there's a clearer mark of Christian maturity than to actually genuinely rejoice with the success of others, especially in areas where we feel that we're not successful. Oh, you got a raise and a new job? I rejoice. Oh, you were able to take that vacation? I rejoice. Oh, you look so good on that Instagram photo? I rejoice. For Paul, his purpose enables him to move past comparison and rivalry. Just imagine your life if you could rejoice in everybody around you and their success. Whew. And then the last, thing that, the last thing that Paul says, I have this purpose, and he makes this pretty clear. He says, um, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain, that actually for Paul, death unveils delight. 
You see, for many people, death is the worst possible thing that could happen. And if your purpose is, is uh, life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, um, death seems to deny that. If your purpose is to um, you know, be happy and live a long life and be healthy and have good friends and family, death is really hard on that purpose. But Paul knew something. He knew that to die was not to encounter death, but to encounter Christ. Let me try to explain this in a couple ways. Uh, maybe this would help. Uh, in in C.S. Lewis, um, in the Chronicles of Narnia, did you guys know that? The Last Battle, the Last Book. There's a, there's a, there's a chapter entitled, uh, Further Up and Farther In. And it's a great chapter. And this is C.S. Lewis's sort of view of death. But try to capture this picture. So uh, here's, some, here's, here's some parts of it. So basically that line, further up and farther in, is how C.S. Lewis understands what happens when we die. And so, it, you know, Aslan breathes upon this, this little group and says this line. He says, uh, we will meet again, uh, but for now, you must go further up and farther in. And the little group of them sort of went and said, this is okay. This is our mission. And they thought that Aslan kind of pointed in that direction, so they started walking in that direction. And then all of these people start to use this phrase to describe the journey of their life. And so a guy named Farsight says, don't stop, further up and farther in. And another person named Jewel says, don't stop, further up and farther in. And um, the unicorn kind of roars it out, further up and farther in. And all these characters, of course, in, in Chronicles of Narnia, all the animals talk, further up and farther in. And they're kind of cheering each other on, further up and farther in. And then partway through, towards uh, the end of the chapter, Lucy is told by the fawn, Mr. Tumnus, he says, the further up and farther in you go, the bigger everything gets. The inside is larger than the outside. Death is like, it's like peeling an onion. But only instead of getting smaller, the more layers that you peel off, the, more, the, the further up you go and the farther in you go, the bigger the circle gets. And everyone is larger. And each, each layer that get peeled away reveals something bigger and brighter and better and more wonderful. Degree after degree after degree. So do you see? Paul has been brought further up, farther in to the center of the universe. And and it has freed him from his fear of death. And when you get freed from the fear of death, you can finally live freely because you have a new... And Paul says, for to me, to live, to die, gain. Because Paul knew something. He knew that there are some things that when you have this purpose, you will never see the end of. Now, you will see the end of some things, like Paul did. You will see the end of war, and you will see the end of abuse, and you will see the end of pain, but you will never see the end of God's justice with this purpose. And you will see the end of depression and anxiety and addiction, but you will never see the end of God's grace. And you will see the end of agony and grief and defeat. But you will not see the end of God's victory. And you will see the end of old age. And you will see the end of cancer. But you will not see the end of God's goodness. You'll never see the end. You'll see the end of graves and goodbyes, but you will not see the end of God's kingdom. And you, and you will see the end of loneliness, confusion, and indecision. But you will never see the end of God's love. And because of that, we can turn to each other and say, everything's going to be all right. Julian of Norwich lived in one of the most difficult times to be alive in England in the 1300s. 
it was a time of, of living hell. Uh, first of all, the bubonic plague came and killed half the population. Now, we've been through a pandemic, but it didn't kill half of the population. And most of the people during that pandemic died within hours of the time that they got the disease. That's what's happening in her world. Uh, add to that crop failures, uh, failures uh, famine, civil war, difficult time. This young lady comes down with, comes down with a bubonic plague in the 1300s. And she's hovering, hovering uh, between life and death for many days. And at that time, she says that she encounters Christ. And she asked Jesus some questions, sort of we would call it like a near-death experience. She asked Jesus some questions. Wouldn't that be great to be able to do? And she receives the answers, and she recovers from the plague, but uh, as the years go by, she reflects upon that encounter, and she reflects on it in a book called Revelations of Divine Love. It was the first book published by a woman in the English language. And in that book, she reflects on that experience. She's a profound mystic, if you read it, and, and... She reflects upon the fact that she was asking God during that time, why is all of this happening? Why does life turn out like this? And Jesus uh, replies to her some things, but in the end he says this famous line. He says to her, all will be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. I did something came out of my mouth before I thought about it. You ever done that? But this time it was, I think, something from maybe my reflections on this. I was at the hospital uh, a little while ago and visited, I think at that time, four people who were close to death. And their spouses were all in the hospital as well. And I said the same thing, something I've never said sort of in a hospital before. I said to them, it's going to be okay. Everything is going to be all right. Not because their spouse was going to live, but because I believe what Julian wrote. And I believe what Sister Julian wrote, and I also believe what Brother John wrote when he said, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and death shall be no more, and sorrow and sin and pain will be no more. The one who is seated on the throne says, I am making all things new. When you have a purpose like Paul's, everything's going to be all right. It's almost like, it's almost like, Jesus, listen. I know the pain is real, but hold on. Or if you can't hold on, just know this. I'm holding on to you, and all will be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. What a purpose Paul had. What would you write? What's the purpose of your life? Maybe you're living for your job or your career or the hope that you will make money or become, or become famous or, or influential. Maybe your purpose in life, if you're honest, is like, I just want a little more, a little more peace, a little bit more money, a little bit more rest, a little bit more happiness. Maybe your purpose, if you're honest, is your hobby. But maybe you just have no idea. Let me just encourage you, um, based on the life of Paul, God has, God has a purpose for you because you're part of his purposes. Paul says, for me to live is Christ. When I was writing that, there's not really anything else that lasts that you can come up with. So I just invite you, um, maybe today, just to, to be honest, maybe you've, you said, yeah, to me to live is Christ, to die is gain, but, but maybe you haven't settled that issue. Before we take communion, uh, just, we'll take a, just 30 seconds or so and just consider your purpose. Father, for the testimony of Paul, 
we're thankful, we're encouraged. And for a lot of us, we, we can hardly imagine a purpose that would turn adversity into an advancement or rivalry to rejoicing or that something as painful as death could actually take us further up and farther in. And so for each person here, we pause and, and just consider our lives and what makes it worth living. If there's something you need to pray this morning, I invite you to do that right now. pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.